welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Libraries Turn the Page podcast, and as so many of you know, I am a huge fan of sci-fi and horror, so when they blend together, it is an immediate yes for me, and this book does it so, so well. Uh, so our author guest today, um, I am going to invite you to introduce yourself and tell us about your book. Hi, I am S.A. Barnes, also known as Stacy. <laughs> that's easier probably than S.A. Barnes, which is kind of a mouthful. And my book that's coming out in February is called Dead Silence. And I pitched it as the Titanic meets the shining set in space. Um, basically, what I wanted to do was a ghost ship slash haunted house uh, in space uh, because I like all of those things and wishing them together was even better. <laughs> So it was so great to read. And this was one of those situations. I mean, usually for me, when something horror comes up, I'm automatically on board. But I got an ARC of this in the mail uh, from the library. And as soon as I opened it, I was like, well, automatically, I'm going to be reading this book. And I just <laughs> know that we need to talk to this author because this hits so many notes um, uh, for um, myself and also um, my colleagues uh, Jen and another Stacy, who like all of the sci-fi fantasy, sci-fi fantasy horror stuff and uh, mashups of it make it even better. But what I love about this book is that the characters are just so heartfelt, and it is so eerie and so creepy that <laughs> I could not put it down. There was just so much, so much going on in it. So, um, talk a little bit about the inspiration behind this book. So, you know, I was thinking about it. I actually started working on this, I think in 2016 or even before, just trying to figure out what it, what it was. Mainly what it was is that I wanted to work on something that I found fascinating, completely engaging, like something that I would want to, it sounds weird, but like live in, does that make sense? And I mean, this is a horror story, so maybe not like completely live in, but you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know what you mean. And my, my, for years has been well, anything ghosts haunted house ghost ship any of that stuff but I have I've been fascinated with the Titanic for years um because I'm old enough to remember before they found it um and when they found it and then um just the debate over what to do about it because it is a mass grave and you have all these artifacts that are being brought up from the bottom and should it be preserved and so then in 2016 or 17 I can't remember where it was but we were in um, I was in uh, Las Vegas for a conference, for a writing conference, and the Luxor had a Titanic exhibit. So I went with my with Melissa Frain, um, who was the acquiring editor for this. Now she works on her own, and um, we're friends. We've been friends for a long time, and we're both obsessed with Titanic. So we went, and that day they happened to have a special exhibit they opened up, and it was just so fascinating to see you know, these socks that had been folded up and retrieved from the bottom of the ocean and hadn't been touched since that person touched them. And I, you know, so I think like all of that kind of like mushed together in my head because I find that really fascinating and also tragic and sad and just a reminder of humanity and all of those things. So I think some of that kind of played into it. I don't know that there's any one, you know, inspiration directly. I've, I love Event Horizon, which is of course what everyone's like, oh, this is like Event Horizon. I'm like, yeah. that is such a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it, it is. But it's not like it takes anything away from Event Horizon. It's a really good um, storyline and it's a good idea and it adds so much of its own flavor. So the, the main character is Claire, who um, she sort of had her own traumatic experience that made herself like her own um, unreliable narrator, I would say, uh, yes. in her own mind. So she doesn't really even trust herself. Uh, and she's got this, this crew, this salvage crew that finds the Aurora, which like the image is just so cool. You talk about Titanic, it's a spaceship, but it's got smokestacks on it, which really seems like something that would happen. I mean, everybody is always so um, obsessed with the past that- yeah. 
you're always, I mean, even, man, this is like going to be a really stupid analogy, but I, you know, I remember like, even like when the PT Cruiser came out, it was, I was like, just right? thinking that yeah, yes. it was supposed to look like those old cars and granted no offense to PT Cruiser fans, but I don't really like the way they drive, <laughs> but you know, I mean like the idea of something having style because like a lot of times vehicles don't, they're just kind of to get from point A to point B, the idea of having a spaceship that have has this old timey style just seems so much like what people would buy into. So of course you'd want uh, like, you know, like the influencers and yeah. whatever the equivalent of the blue blood community would be that time to be, have been the, um, the uh guests on the ship and claire and her uh her crew um come upon it and of course you know it, it comes to mind that well there's going to be valuable stuff on it so of course we should loot the ship because it's been missing for 20 that ship's been missing for 20 some years nobody's ever heard from it and then there's nobody responding to their to use a star trek term responding to their hail <laughs> you know right. there's nobody like answering and they're like well if nobody's there, it's finders keepers, it's there for the taking, you know, we might as right. well, because they're going to, well, all of them are going to have to be moving on to another job because they're being replaced by, you know, technology. Um, and Claire specifically is not really got a great solid future. So this would really help them. So yeah, I, I think there was a definitely a part of me that looked at this and I was like, yeah, it's cool to go on there for treasure, but I wanted it to be very much this thing that would make their lives better you know what I mean it wasn't just about greed you know it was yeah, yeah. so so I mean just, just thinking about that so like you have this ship that literally has gold faucets that was the <laughs> yes. thing that everyone's talking about is golden faucets meanwhile there are people who are going to be replaced their jobs are going to be replaced by machines it's such a good um look at just like excess versus the stark reality of people who just don't have, you know, the ability to live um, or earn a living wage. And, you know, Claire, like I said, like she has like this, this really traumatic past where she doesn't trust her own judgment. And she's not even sure whether or not, I mean, like there's one character who definitely makes it very clear that he doesn't like her, but she's yes. got another. Yeah. He like, he reminded me a little bit of Jane from Firefly. You yeah. Know? I can see that. I can see that. Yes. Right. He's just like, ugh, you know, like sometimes you're just like, okay, Jane, I'll give you that one. And then most of the time you're like, Jane, <laughs> you're just kind of a bastard. Um, but you know, there were other characters that treated her very tenderly and like, she almost didn't trust their friendship and you know I, i'm getting like just to kind of get into it so you, you talk about it being like a haunted house on on a spaceship story so like you have this elegant ship which makes me think of the titanic and also um the hotel from the shining sure. but mm -hmm. like when you get into it i i kind of don't like i'm thinking about it in my mind as to what they see when they get closer to the ship but even though I really want to talk about it, I'm also not going to because <laughs> just that moment of first contact where they're like, okay, we're going in, you know, but hundreds and hundreds of people died and disappeared, you know, were, were there survivors? And then like, you start getting that picture as to what happened to them mm -hmm. is the creepiest thing. <laughs> it's just beyond creepy and I don't want to rob anybody of reading just that whole description <laughs> thank you <laughs> I had I, I I mean you know what's funny is again when I sat down to write this I wrote to entertain myself and I did not know that I was writing horror I knew I was writing a sci-fi probably a sci-fi thriller but I did not think about it from the horror context and then everybody read it like you know this is horror right you wrote this and I was like oh I mean I love horror I read horror I just didn't think that I was doing that um so for me when I was writing those scenes which I will also avoid describing in detail I was really just writing for whatever would creep me out whatever would creep me out whatever would gross me out whatever would freak me out and yet you know would keep me intrigued so that was the whole motivation behind that <laughs> yeah it really worked for a reader as well um so I I mean I, I just 
loved it. But then it's also kind of told from two timelines. It's told from the past with Claire really remembering finding this ship. Um, and also she's being questioned because you find out that something happened, something went awry, big surprise on a salvage mission <laughs> where they decide they're going to loot one of the most infamous disappearances of a ship ever. Uh, so was it difficult for you to kind of keep the timelines different and did you always know where it was going? I, that was really, it's an interesting question because uh, when I first had this idea, I was, I have several friends who are writers that I was like trying to, you know, say, hey, this is what I want to do, but I'm really stuck. I can't, I had a terrible time at the beginning. I had the worst time with the beginning. Um, there's even a version of it where Reed, it's Reed's perspective at the beginning. I mean, it's bad. So I had a hard time kind of jumping in. So when I was talking about it, they're like, why are you doing this from the, the future where she's talking about the past, like why do it? I'm like, because I want to frame it that way because I feel like otherwise you're missing a chunk of the story. And also I didn't realize it until much later when I went back and was thinking about things. Um, it's, I feel it's very much influenced by Aliens, um, the second movie, because where she's standing in that boardroom talking to them going, you, you can't do this. Bad stuff happens, you can't go back, don't do this. And then they're like, hey, we want you to come with us. <laughs> and you know, I, that's why I wanted to do that because I also really wanted to play up the idea of not knowing what happened because I think one of the scariest things in the world is not being able to trust your own judgment like to know if your judgment is tilted one way or another if you may have done something you don't even remember how terrifying is that um and I really wanted to do that in terms of keeping track of it my bigger fear was trying to I felt that the past so in other words where they're getting on the ship and bad things are happening and whatever I knew that that would be going on, but I didn't want to end it there. I wanted there to be some kind of resolution. So like when she's being you know, interviewed, I had to bring the two kind of together and I wasn't sure people would make that leap with me. Um, so I'm glad it, I'm glad it worked um, because that was, that was probably the hardest part was how do I, how do I get now I've got this past thing going on. We reach a certain point and now we're here in the present and I don't want to lose people once I stop talking about the past. Um, but I, I hope that it weaves together well, because that was what I wanted was sort of that extra context of, you know, um, her being interrogated, basically. Yeah, and I think part of it that helped is her backstory and having a key player um, in this traumatic thing that happened to her as a child. And I don't mean to keep talking in that in code as well. <laughs> but I, again, like I really think because it all really does fit together, um, there is somebody from her past who's involved in the interrogation, who knows about both situations. So I, I think that that really helped uh, connect the two parts. Um, and you know what, and the more I think about it, because we're, you know, while I'm talking about this with you, so it's got, it's, it's space horror, um, mm -hmm. so sci-fi and horror, and um, it's got a little bit of like, like class, social structure, horror too, which is something that has kind of always been around, but I guess I've been more conscious of it recently, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because you do have this idea of people living in excess on the back of other people. And then in the end, it's just horrific for everybody. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I loved that you know, I, I think we are more, oh, I, I speak, I'm speaking for myself, I'm more aware of that these days. Um, but what I was interested in is just sort of that idea, you know, that like when the Titanic went down, going back to that, it was, you know, mostly third class passengers who lost their lives for a variety of reasons, including that they had gates closed that, you know, that, you know, whatever. Um, and I guess in this case, I was looking at this going, yeah, I mean, these people have had every privilege do not necessarily see themselves as being privileged, but are there. And, you know, it's, there's a, there's a probably a tiny part of me that really enjoyed, <laughs> you know, setting that up where terrible things happen to them because they think that they're untouchable. Um, I mean, there's the, the Dunleavies, which I had a great time. Um, were they, were they, like, so were they like supposed to kind of be the Kardashians? 
I am not sure if it's a good idea for me to say whether or not, but if you got that from that, I'm really I, I got, I got, like the, I got the whole idea from the Dunleavies as, you know, like it's a family that were famous for, as they say, famous for being famous, which doesn't really make a ton of sense, but famous for doing something that might have made not rich people, not famous or infamous in a bad way, but worked for them because they had money behind them. I mean, it, it, it very, very much. I was inspired by the Kardashians on that because I don't understand. I, I don't understand that, and that that is nothing to say. You know, people, I, I just don't understand it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I kind of that that idea of we're going to be famous and behave in some ways terribly um, publicly, and that's only going to get us more acclaim. Um, was really intriguing to me because I do think that's an intersection of wealth and privilege, you know, again, where as to, to your point, you could behave that exact same way as somebody who didn't have those things and that would not have the same result. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's just, a, it's a really weird thing. And then at the same time, you know, you kind of go back on it and you, you sort of wonder like, would they have be even behaved that way if, the chips were different, you know, like, obviously, the, um, the consequences would have been different. But the consequences, I mean, it's just like, it just was such earth shattering visual detail as to what happened. Um, and yeah, it was it was good. It actually almost made me wonder, and this is kind of a silly question, maybe, how come you went for solid gold faucets instead of solid gold toilets? <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I honestly don't know. And it was certainly not, I, I didn't think about the, the toilet part of it. I guess I could have. I honestly don't know where that came from. It was just in there suddenly. And it, it was, I think part of it, it was, it was, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect because it really seems like something somebody would do, especially if you're trying to call back this, I, I, you know, and when you think about the Titanic in general, like this is, the, this story predates the Titanic by a lot um you know but like of course people just keep their minds just keep going back to these things that were considered luxurious but maybe sure. doomed uh that seems like something that people would have done i guess like for me you know when you when you think about like i guess bathroom things being like solid gold it's like the ultimate slap in the face like you know people are people are starving and it's like, I'm just going to wash my hands or something else on this thing that could probably buy you a whole house um, and then some. So, uh, you know, and it also kind of makes me think, it's like, I had this very strange person come to my elementary school, uh, like a folk singer. Um, and this was Syosset schools. And I apologize to Syosset schools, but I'm sure if anybody grew up at the same time as me, they remember this. There was like a folk singer who came and he did these songs and he did a song about the Titanic and about oh, the really? people waving the poor people goodbye as they drowned or something. Oh I, my god! May, maybe my context is, maybe my context is wrong. Maybe it was the other way around, but I just remember being in like elementary school and being like, ah, oh, this is kind of messed <laughs> up. Yes. <laughs> Um, from a practical standpoint, I think I wanted it something that she thought she could carry off the ship, like from a, from a very practical standpoint. Um, but I don't know where, I honestly don't know where the faucet came from, but I think you're exactly right to me. It's, it's that idea of, we have so much luxury. We waste it on things that, that don't really even need to be luxurious. I mean, everyone could argue, oh, you know, higher quality bedding or, you know, a really fancy sofa, like that would improve your experience of using those items. The faucet, it's gold or stainless steel the water comes out just the same so it's yeah 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 so I just like think people are gonna love this book and um anybody who enjoys horror you know even if you're sci-fi curious or sci-fi isn't your thing there's just so much in it um and I loved Claire's character a lot I really really liked the twist, um, which is another thing I don't want to talk about because <laughs> I don't want people to really get that. Uh, cause, uh, but the, I, I am curious as to what kind of research went into psychology and, um, without giving too much away. Um, well, I'm going to try, uh, I'm trying to think about how to talk about that without uh, giving anything away. How about you say, um, did you do a lot of research into the thing? I, 
I did. I did. Um, I mean, you know, it's only funny as a writer, you're always thinking, oh, you know, you imagine writers sitting like in a library with a stack of books, which I certainly have done in the past. But in this case, it was really more just tracking down um, experiences and people talking about their experiences. Um, and there's also um, definitely an element of mental illness and how mental illness is treated and how we understand mental illness. Um, I read an article that has, I mean, I think had tremendous influence on me, which is basically the idea that creative people and uh, people who struggle with mental illness, sometimes those Venn diagrams overlap. I mean, I am, I'm also a diagnosed uh, general, generalized anxiety disorder. So I definitely have that. Um, yeah, so many, lots of us do. Um, and I, I think that I was very interested in like how those things all intersect together. And also just like in a very larger sense of how do we define to use a, to, you know, to use this, you know, we say that that person, there's something wrong with them because they're seeing this or they're doing this, but how do we know just because your reality doesn't agree with mine? Like, where's that line? Um, someone mentioned in an article that I read was something about like angels. You know, there's a huge portion of the United States population that believes in guardian angels, that believes they've seen angels or witnessed the actions of angels, but nobody thinks that they should be on medication and, or, you know, locked up and that's fine. But then there's a different, you see, there's like a weird line there when you start thinking about it, but we're just so used to it, we don't think about it. Um, so I was really intrigued by that. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think like through Claire, you can also see how um, the, de the, the depiction of mental health and also just how people react to people who have experienced um, mental illness before, how they internalize what people say think to of them. them. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so this book was Awesome. Is there going to be anything else in universe? I, I got the sense that this was very complete, but I would very much like to revisit this world if that door is open. That I think is going to kind of depend. I, I do have an idea that is um, space horror that definitely could be in the same universe. It wouldn't be anything obvious. In other words, there wouldn't be any. In fact, the timeline would be it's farther forward even yet because I wanted to advance technology to be able to do something. Um, we will see if that's something that happens. Um, I would definitely like to write more space horror just because I love I love science fiction and I, I love being creeped out. So I guess well, I think things there's together. definitely, especially in the pandemic, I, and like, I'm sure listeners are really sick of hearing me say this, but I have read more horror in the pandemic than I have in my entire life. And it's not because I disliked horror in the past, you know, like after I was like eight years old or actually, no, that's not true. After I like was 20, I, cons I began to consume horror a lot more. I was kind of a scaredy cat up until that point. But really, like finding comfort in it came in just constantly feeling anxious and there being like a real life horror show happening outside. So as a librarian um, and as a reader, anytime something would come up that would sort of make my mind anxious about something that wasn't actually happening, but could you know, maybe it felt like it could. And like, as is, like, even though this is science fiction, like it really felt very um, real. Uh, I just picked it up. So I, I think that this is going to check a lot of boxes for people. And it really just delivers some ha heart pounding scares. Like I said, like that opening moment where they start to approach the Aurora alone is just something that will never leave me. It was really good. <laughs> Thank um, you. Thank yeah. You. Uh, so are you, so really quickly before we go, are you a sci-fi in general person? What is your usual sci-fi jam? Oh gosh. Yeah. I was raised, um, on both Star Trek and Star Wars. My parents actually, I had a conversation with my mom, um, not that long ago. And it was like, you know, I don't remember ever seeing the first Star Wars. And she's like, well, that is because we took you to the theater when you were two, because we knew you would sit through it. And I was like, oh great. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, the people in that theater must have like been horrified at a toddler with a kid <laughs> coming in there. But apparently I sat through the whole thing. So I don't, I've been raised on it. My dad, um, is a big sci-fi fantasy person. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I read all kinds of things. What I love, um, gosh, I loved recently. Um, oh, I'm going to blank on her name. Uh, Wallace, Callie Wallace. Um, I think that's right. The She wrote actually something called Dead, Dead Space. And um, I cannot think of the other one. Salvation, Salvation Day, Salvation Day. Sorry, it's right behind me. Um, 
I loved those uh, recently, and I love anything that uh, T. Kingfisher writes. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily like sci-fi, although the, I still would make the argument that the most recent one with the pawn shop and the hole in the wall could be, that's multiple universes, like the, you yeah, know. <laughs> universes is sci-fi, right? I agree. Yeah, yeah totally. I, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, I think so. I actually recommend a lot of multiple universe books to people who are not hard sci-fi fans, but open to it. Yes, 100%. That's why I actually really liked so uh Blake Crouch's uh Dark Matter. Yes. Right, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So what I loved about that book and what I hoped to do with this book or anything that I write in that area is I, I felt like it was really accessible for readers who were not hardcore devoted sci-fi or hardcore devoted horror readers. It's it's the con the concepts are there and I think it can be open to anybody, but I feel like it's I, I feel like it's accessible. Like sometimes I sometimes I think in any in any genre we tend to like close ranks. You know, like they're going to make this just for the devoted people. And it's like, no, we want this to be open for everyone to enjoy this, you know, whatever. So I tried to write it in a fashion that was sort of like what Blake Crouch did um, with Dark Matter, yeah. where, you know, you know, people who are romance fans can read it or people who are, you know, action adventure fans. Like, you know, I wanted that's what I wanted. <laughs> well, you succeeded. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes next from you. Do you have something else on the slate or not quite yet? I have um, a couple of proposals that'll be going in just after the break. So keep nice. your fingers crossed for me. Um, and <laughs> we'll, and I'm really excited about both of them. Um, and we'll see, we'll see what they say. So that's where I'm at right now. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this was Jessica with Sayos at Libraries from the Page Podcast. Our awesome guest today was S.A. Barnes. Welcome and Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Dead Silence is due out when? February 8th. Excellent. We are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.